Uh, dear participants, welcome to panel HIST 04, uh, Hospitality and Trans-Imperial Mobilities in the Pacific uh, 1910s, 1940s. Uh, my name is Dick Stegerens of University of Oslo, and I will uh, chair and comment to this session. Uh, so, uh, Elliot, uh, your 20 minutes are starting right now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's, that's not working. Okay, hopefully you can all see the slides there. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Andrew Elliott. I'm uh, at Doshisha Women's College. I'm just finishing up a year as visiting researcher at the Japan Research Center at SOAS. And I'd like to thank Doshisha Women's College for generous funding for this. My paper is called Anglophone Travelers, Tourism Providers and Host Guest Encounters in the Japanese Empire. So, thinking about uh, inbound, outbound tourism in the Japanese Empire, Gao Yuan and others have identified three main patterns. One, imperial tours of Japanese to colonial territories. Two, colonial tours to Japan mainland. And three, foreign travel to Japan and colonial territories. My focus is on the uh, third of these, what is usually referred to as international tourism or Kokusai Kanko by the 1930s. Now to start with a little bit of background, I won't go over all of this, just some important details in bold. So state involvement in international tourism in colonial ter territories uh, predated that in the metropole. So upon establishment in 1906, South Manchurian Railway Company, Mantetsu, or SMR, was charged with building accommodation for foreign passengers and providing restaurant and laundry services. And then SMR, along with government railways in Korea and Taiwan, they were founding members of Japan Tourist Bureau in 1912. And that same year, J JTB set up branch offices across the empire in the Kwantung Lease Territory in Korea and Taiwan, and within a few years had opened um, a Naijo uh, in um, uh, tourist um, information offices there. So in that sense, the empire is a key part of state efforts in international tourism from the beginning, rather than a later appendage. And these were the key organizations until 1930, when, as Daniel mentioned, the uh, Koksai Kanko Kyoku, or um, Board of Tourist Industry, was established. This was the first um, central government um, organ to deal with tourism. And this organized guided tours around Japan and overseas territories, among other activities. The state had two main objectives for international tourism. One was economic from the beginning, basically um, bringing in foreign currency by increasing tourist numbers. Second was political. From the beginning, it was talked about in terms of improving international friendship, Koksai Shinzen but also increasingly more explicitly into the 19th, um, from about 1932-3, of course, the Manchuria invasion, talked about in terms of cultural diplomacy, Kokujo Bunka Senden. Now, the targets of international tourism policy were usually referred to as gaikyaku or gaijin kankosha, so foreign guests or foreign tourists. But in practice, this meant recreational travelers from the US, from Europe, uh, especially Britain, Australia, and Canada. And it also included Western residents of treaty ports and colonial territories across Asia who were specifically targeted in promotions and reforms. I have a bit of data here on numbers of foreign arrivals, data on visitors to An Niger, but I'm just going to skip over this. We can come back to it in the Q&A if anyone's interested. So my paper today considers discussions about and provisions of international tourism hospitality in the Japanese empire. And it takes examples from Korea and Manchuria, the most popular destinations, and to some, ex some extent, to some extent, Taiwan. It's primarily concerned with the period from the early 1900s to the beginning of the Pacific War. And it takes a somewhat general approach to this subject in an attempt to consider the type of relations that emerged through the provision and acceptance of tourism hospitality 
and how this may have functioned to achieve international tourism's political objectives. Now, hospitality was a key concern of policymakers, industry leaders, and service providers from the beginning. It appears in the literature as gaijin or gaikyaku no setsugu, taigu, sabisu, etc. And it covered things like service encounters with front stage workers like Annaijo staff, guides, hotel and ryokan staff, um, steamer stewards, train attendants, and, and, and police and custom officers as well. And also it included facilities at sightseeing spots in hostelries and on transport. Now the literature on this reveals a careful and arguably unprecedented attention to satisfying the emotional, cognitive and physical needs of foreign visitors. So in this hospitality as welcome overlaps and intersects with hospitality as comfort and tied up with both concepts or ideas such as safety and security, the familiar and ordered, homely, easy, convenient, cleanliness, freedom from constraint, openness. Now, the importance of welcoming and providing comfort to foreign guests went largely unquestioned right up until the eve of the Pacific War. But debates about what kind of welcome, what, kind, what the levels of welcome and comfort, et cetera, and who to provide it to, um, these are continuing debates. And at the root of these debates are questions, anxieties perhaps, about the balance of political and cultural power between Western states and Japan. Now, in 1917, this is the top quotation here from um, JTB's Tsuristo magazine. South Sea's explorer and director of the Japan India Association, Soijima uh, Yasoroku, expressed his understanding of this asymmetry in overseas travel expe expectations as followed. Um, uh, I won't read the quotation out. On the other hand, however, the act of hosting foreign travelers functioned as a performance and sign of national cultural power, um, as in the bottom quotation here from a um, English language publication, Japan in advance, the Japanese are a hospitable nation, they're ever ready to welcome foreign guests, etc. Now, close to the end of my period, economist uh, Ueda Tatsunosuke brought these two themes together in an article about tourist Japan in an international con uh, context, which was published in the um, Board of Tourist Industries Koksai Kanko magazine in 1939. And this draws an analogy between the Roman and Japanese empires. So quoting Cicero, Ueda argues that truly great empires are hospitable empires. They are powerful enough and confident enough in their own power to welcome foreigners and treat them well without rushing to satisfy guests every whim. Weda thus proposes a vision of hospitality as mutual accommodation. The guest is welcomed into the home as a member of the family without the necessity to adapt it unduly to fit foreign norms. Also, Weda uses this analogy to underline the positive role of imperial expansion in extending hospitality ethics into new lands. Now this, he argues, is what Rome achieved, hospitality as part of a civilizing mission, teaching the barbarian to welcome foreign others. Now in discussing the Japanese empire, Ueda leaves aside questions of barbarians or teaching spreading hospitality ethics to focus rather on the act of hosting foreign, meaning Western guests, that is performing hospitality with patrician calm. And he gives the English here, along with a Japanese translation, Chosha no Ochizuki. Ueda suggests this is itself sufficient in both justifying empire and working as proof of imperial greatness. Finally, Ueda turns to the question of what precisely foreign tours of the empire should achieve. And Weda makes a case for the value of first-hand observation of colonial territories as a way to win hearts and minds, but not this alone. In the same section, Weda claims that a safe or secure lifestyle, seikatsu no anzen, is the predominant underlying requirement of Western tourists in Japan and empire. Now, Weda's argument here, to extrapolate slightly, is an increasingly common one through the 1920s and 1930s, 
that hospitality is the bedrock upon which mobility, tourist promotions, and sightseeing activities must be built. It is pointless to attract tourists, transport them, give them sites to view if they are not made to feel welcome and comfortable at the same time. Now, this was important from an economic perspective, but it was also important for tourism as cultural diplomacy. Good treatment led to customer satisfaction, which led in turn to better views of Japan. As Goto Asataro argued in the pages of Tsuristo in January 1925, telling foreigners about Japan's greatness is all well and good, um, but it is all to nothing if I'm unable to read my own quotation, but if they are not uncomfortable at the same time. Turning to the empire then, um, more, more, more specifically, so a key difference between international tourism in Japan mainland and tourism in Taiwan, Korea, and Manchuria was the power enjoyed by state organizations. So in Japan, competition from commercial tourism operators meant that JTB's ideal of curating a series of positive, quote, first impressions throughout an entire tour, and that's mentioned in the Bureau Yomi, Yomi Hona, um, uh, industry, a reader for in industry um, workers published by JTB in 1936. This idea of um, curating the tour and managing it all precisely in, in Japan itself, it was never practically achievable. Yet in colonial territories, JTB working together with government railways and SMR had a de facto monopoly of the international tourism industry, simply because they were the sole providers of the types of services most foreign tourists demanded. And on the left, I've just put some, um, <clears throat> some sections from Terry's Guide to the Japanese Empire in 1928, talking about the um, hotels and, and rail services in um, Korea, Manchuria and, um, and Taiwan. Now, this oversight extended not just to transport and the selection and framing of sites. These organizations had a hand in the most basic services and amenities that were used by tourists on a daily basis. Things that are often overlooked in studies focused on tourist mobilities and touristic representations. And most obviously, this control functioned via the dual management of accommodation, the Yamato railway and station hotels, and transport services. So even independent travelers, those not on a, on a tour, tended to move from one hotel to the next, one destination to the other, without the need to negotiate from with anyone from outside JTB or rail organizations. Typically, managers of hotels or JTB and Nigel staff organized guide services and sightseeing tours for the destination, and they booked the next leg of trips. Now, in the case of an Nigel operated by JTB's Dairen branch office, staff were permanent bureau employees, not hotel staff, um, as in Hotel Anno in Japan. Now, this meant they had a greater range of duties and, and it meant JTB could manage staff and their interactions with customers more carefully through exams and job interviews and through staff training material. But hotels in particular dominated tourist experiences of colonial territories in other ways as well by providing a set of amenities and services that helped order and sustain itineraries. Things like white sheeted fluffy pillowed beds, tables and chairs, closets, private baths, Western style toilets, hot and cold water, electric lighting, heating and cooling facilities, panoramic views, grassy lawns, clear pricing systems, or three meals a day, sports facilities, cafes, barbers, access to dental treatment and haircuts, movie showings, steam laundries, conversations with English speaking staff. And thus the Yamato station and railway hotels function symbolically, we might say, as a home, which provided, quote, a transcendental point, transcendental point of reference that organized and domesticated a given area by defining all of the points in relation to it. And relatedly, we might frame these hotels and the rail services that connected them, et cetera, 
as comfort zones with all that we understand that term to mean. Now, similar arguments have been made elsewhere about European colonial hotels across Asia, hotels which served a similar set of foreign customers as the Yamato and other government-run chains. But there are important differences in ownership, staffing, and guests between European colonial hotels and these Japanese ones, which complicate how we read the latter, including the social relations that emerge from them. And here I think we might be able to extrapolate from hotels to think about the international tourist experience in the empire more widely. That is, quotidian and not so quotidian physical activities like eating, drinking, bathing, sleeping, going to the toilet, dressing in clean clothes, relaxing in a soft chair under the sun were performed by tourists with the support and under the security offered by Japanese colonial authorities. Now, generally, we might presume tourists voluntarily bought into this dependent relationship for the duration of their travels. It made for an enjoyable trip in which, as in the top quotation here, the pleasures of scenery, etc., could be enjoyed without constraint. But this was actually a more complex relationship than the dependence of the tourist on service providers. So Martinez and, and others in their 2019 book on colonialism and male domestic servants in the Asia Pacific, they discuss how guests controlled the welcome at the grand colonial hotels of European empires in Asia. But the Japanese empire was not, from an international tourism perspective, simply a reversal of that, i.e. the hosts in control. Tourists often felt in control because of the familiarity of the services, but also because of the attentive service and luxurious fittings. They often felt like VIPs, potentates indeed. It was in the end, as this my second quotation here suggests, a negotiation with mutual benefits as long as one's expected role was played out. This is from Kirtland Swift's Finding the Worthwhile in the Orient. Um, if you are a wise traveler, you will immediately declare yourself tremendously amazed and impressed. This is the Chosen Hotel. Then every member of the staff will endeavor to impress you the more, and you will receive all the attentions a potentate might demand. Indeed, tourism providers often represented the relationship of front stage workers and tourists as a fundamentally equal one, not that of master and servant, which can be seen here in these uh, images of tourist and guide interactions. And this is from um, Japan rather than colonial territories, but these are insects from one month tour of Japanese culture. So in international tourism, workers and travelers were assumed to speak the same language, literally and figuratively, to have the same expectations and standards. And it was on this basis, a shared understanding of the norms and values and practices of tourism, that intimate, even interchangeable relations of host guest were constructed. Now, one way this was affected was in the opposition between the services provided and accepted within the hotel or the train, et cetera, and the exotic tourist object outside the hotel or train, et cetera. That is, yeah. Elliot, you have two minutes to conclude. Oh, okay. That is against the included as excluded third man of Aborigines in Taiwan, the old Chinese town in Mukden, Koreans in traditional costumes, et cetera, et cetera. Japanese host and foreign guest were joined as subjects of tourism. And you can see this juxtaposition of comfort on the one hand and the curious on the other in postcards like this. Now in the production of this kind of tripartite relationship, the actual ethnicity of workers was arguably irre irre irrelevant. I, I, I would like to find out more, maybe some um, participants here know more about this, about the ethnicity and background of tourism related employees of Mantetsu and JTB, et cetera. Now travelogues do interestingly report on Korean guides in particular, 
But the evidence generally in travel texts suggests that most of the front stage rail and hotel workers encountered by foreign tourists in colonial territories were ethnically Japanese or they were assumed to be. And to the extent that these types of spaces and services were coded modern and universal, the actual ethnicity of staff perhaps had little impact on their symbolic value. Now this can be seen in promotional material like here, where through captions and dress, a division is established between modern universal tourist subjects, hosts and guests on the left here, and ethnically or nationally defined tourist objects on the right here. So in this paper, just to turn to the conclusion, in this paper, I've suggested that tourism hospitality being welcomed and made comfortable led to the production of intimate relations between Japanese host and foreign guest in the empire. Familiar services and amenities encourage tourists to feel effective attachment towards their hosts on a range of levels, which positively shaped views of Japan as a modern global power, its empire and colonies, its international or inter-imperial relations. Now, in this sense, I might argue that although sightseeing spots, exotic landscapes and customs, the curious, were the hooks that were used to draw tourists in, it was touristic services and service encounters, comfort, that made tourism successful as cultural diplomacy after they arrived, and to the extent that tourism was successful as cultural diplomacy in the end. Now, in travel and promotional texts, Japan was imagined and often experienced as a home away from home. Now, for some travelers, this meant that Japan, e.g. the main islands, worked as a geographical base from which to explore the empire. But more generally, it refers to how travelers increasingly approached Japan, the metropole, Japan as an imperial power, as a known, familiar, dependable order, allowing safe and comfortable tourist travels through its empire, as can be seen in the given quotes here. So it, that industry- Elliot, I think we have to stop here. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that then. Just a few paragraphs left to go and come back to those later. Okay. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, so this panel is actually an extension of the uh, related Empire in Mobility panel on wartime tourism at the 2019 AAS in Asia Bangkok conference. And the uh, brilliant, here it is, uh, Japan Review special issue on war, tourism, and modern Japan of the same year. Um, in Bangkok, uh, I also functioned as a commentator, although the field of tourism is not my field of study. I major in modern Japanese history, mainly intellectual history, and Japanese views of the outside world and Japanese self-identities have been a main theme in my research. At present, my major individual research project concerns post-war Japanese war films. And these are rather about dominating the Japanese collective memory about the war, uh, rather than about presenting Japan to the outside world. Whereas in Bangkok, I presented quite extensive comments, also endeavoring to bring the papers together and preparing a PowerPoint, uh, this time around, I will focus on the individual papers and will try to be as brief as possible in order to open the floor for our audience. And as I tend to do, and I assume it's the reason why they requested me once again, um, I'll focus uh, on what I consider the uh, potential points of uh, improvement uh, of the papers and we'll leave the praise for the virtual drinking session afterwards. Um, so, Daniel, um, you obviously point out some similarities between the aims and promotion of the Tokyo 1940 Olympics and the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Uh, I can also imagine huge differences apart from the fact that the 1940 edition did not occur uh, and would have been interested uh, to have your thoughts about those as well. Um, earlier research concludes that international tourism 
also in Japan, started to function as a tool of state propaganda in the 1930s. And thus, it seems logical to put the Tokyo 1940 Olympics within that framework, just as I think it's pretty much okay to do for the 1964 and 2020 Olympics. Um, I actually wouldn't mind you prioritizing these motivations over any financial ones. The potential numbers of visitors and foreign currency income uh, seem like mere daydreaming when compared to the numbers that you also give, at least in my paper I received, uh, of annual uh, foreign tourists to uh, Japan and the unmentioned, but probably uh, huge costs of organizing the Olympics even in those days. Um, the abstract and the original paper uh, mentioned individuals and agencies who sought to limit the potentially disruptive influence, even a polluting threat of international tourism. And this of course raises uh, interest. Uh, however, so eventually you did not uh, present those and accordingly so also slightly wondering how substantial uh, these are uh, but they would make uh, maybe for a nice link uh, with present day anti-Olympics uh, sentiments in many parts of the world. Um, you mention uh, various results of uh, previous research by others, uh, but none by Japanese. Uh, has there not been any attention in Japanese academia for wartime tourism and the aborted 1940 Olympics is something that made me wonder. Uh, then so shifting to uh, Elliot's paper, um, in, in your paper, you provide uh, us with a, a large amount of interesting and often detailed information. However, the framework within and the reason why we are presented with uh, this information, uh, regrettably uh, remains relatively unclear. Uh, I, I could have dealt with uh, a more uh, detailed and clear uh, research question, and I would be more interested to find out, so how does this all link uh, to previous research by others, both in the field of Japan or maybe uh, uh, so uh, about other countries? And then also, so considering the research that you have done uh, by yourself uh, previously, uh, what is new? Uh, in, in this presentation, so compared to your previous research. Um, on top of that, I was also rather intrigued by the uh, facilities that were made especially for Western tourists. So, but then in the late 1930s were also opened to Japanese imperial tourists. Uh, what were those facilities and, and in which ways were these uh, different? Uh, so compared to the facilities uh, provided to the Japanese. And then uh, I'm not sure whether it was in the presentation that you did, so, but in the version I received, there was a, a chapter title, uh, which was Empire of Hospitality. Uh, and I couldn't help thinking that it was so catching that you definitely have to elevate this uh, to a book title. Um, your research, uh, seems very open uh, for most insightful international comparisons. Uh, did other colonialist countries also employ state-run organizations and facilities in order to promote or maybe to make more money out of their colonial possessions? Um, does latecomer and non-Western Japan uh, so stand out within this framework? And if yes, how, or are commonalities more dominant? Uh, and then, uh, so for Toku's paper, um, your paper is uh, more descriptive than uh, analytical. And moreover, uh, the information did not strike me as surprising. I couldn't help thinking whether any part of this uh, historical incident uh, is going to stick in the historian's mind. 
as the attention for Mexico so was very short lived and all uh, ideas and projects so soon came to naught, it seems rather insignificant and will probably remain unmentioned even in specialized academic works. That is my first impression. So uh, in order to change this situation, I would like to recommend you to, to make a much stronger case in your paper and related work why this incident is uh, significant and force us to wake up uh, and take uh, notice. Um, and then the fact that Japanese at the time considered themselves superior to Mexicans and that their uh, Yamato spirit could contribute to, to and even lead the country uh, are not uh, surprising to me. Um, these fit exactly within uh, the dominant Japanese view of the outside world. Um, just like uh, the inferi inferiority complex towards uh, the West and the craving uh, for recognition from the so-called best of the West that mentioned or unmentioned is so evident from the two other uh, presentations. Um, and then maybe one slightly connecting uh, remark uh, in terms of number and aimed and the aim at an elite in order to create a better image and understanding. Uh, uh, so in, in the West, uh, pre-war tourism may link rather to uh, present day policies to attract foreign students uh, to Japan uh, than uh, that it links uh, to present day uh, mass tourism. Um, let me stop here.